Our next speaker is Adam Bant. After a career as an industrial lawyer, uh, Adam won the seat of Melbourne in 2010. <laughs> becoming the first Green candidate ever to occupy a seat in the House of Representatives in the Commonwealth Parliament. Adam has, for most of his life, been dedicated to public interest campaigning and advocating for Melbourne residents' values now on issues like refugees, health, equal marriage and public transport and now freedom of speech in the Australian Commonwealth. Thanks very much. I um watched with interest the unfolding reports of Julian Assange's first uh, bail hearing and noted that the address that he gave in Australia, in Melbourne, is a terrace house in Grattan Street in Carlton. Um, that makes him, or well, that makes me, his local member. Uh, and uh, I'm extraordinarily proud to be his local member and to be able to speak in some capacity on his behalf. Um, but I'm also speaking here as a member of a party that believes that the rapid spread of communication technologies has some really exciting potentials for openness and democracy, about which I'll say a bit more later. But first, I think it's important to go back to some basic principles. In the initial days of the WikiLeaks revelations, the gut responses of senior members of the political establishment here and abroad spoke volumes about the current state of our democracy. Here we had an Australian citizen who had not been charged, let alone convicted, of any crime relating to the leaked information. Here was someone whose lawyers had written several months ago to the Australian Federal Police, putting themselves on the record and saying, if you need to speak to Julian Assange about anything, if you have concerns that he's broken any law, get in touch. And of course, there was no contact. And he was someone who had done no more than make available to the public the things that were being said and done in their names. We had people calling him a terrorist. We had people who wanted to be the President of the United States of America calling for him to be hunted down and executed. In such a situation, a straight application of the rule of law, or indeed the simple words that you find on the inside of your passport when you go home that promises the Australian government will look after you when you're overseas, should have seen our government calling for his protection, reminding people that he was innocent until proven guilty. And And to repeat something that I said, and that many others have said before some very recent tragic events, we should have sent a loud message to the world, and especially to the United States, that calling for someone to be killed can have deadly consequences, giving the green light to any disgruntled individual to inflict their own kind of permanent retribution. And instead, we had discussion publicly of cancelling his passport, a statement from our Prime Minister that what he and WikiLeaks did was illegal. The gut reaction was not to defend but to attack, and it's here that I get the most worried. I, like most people, I think, if the polls are correct, am grateful for what WikiLeaks has done and that we are finding out about what is being said in our name at home and overseas, and especially uh, with respect to Indonesia, Papua, some of those events that Julian's lawyer and Julian spoke about so eloquently. And WikiLeaks has reminded us that it is essential to our democracy that when force and violence are deployed in our name by armies and in wars, that we are not lied to or misled, as, and citizens know exactly as much as the government knows before we put troops in harm's way and before we inflict suffering and death here and overseas. But what the gut response of political leaders, or some of those political leaders, tells us is that our so-called inalienable rights stand ready to be waived at a moment's notice. And I think that governments have got used to saying that circumstances are so dire, or an individual so terrible, or somehow second class, 
that the usual rights and protections applying to full citizens can be suspended. But George Bush and John Howard had this down to a fine art um, by calling David Hicks an enemy combatant instead of a prisoner or a citizen, and by declaring his unspecified activities to be monstrous, he was placed in a legal limbo that took over six years to get, to get out of. And in the construction industry, as Chris has mentioned, because of the alleged rough and exceptional culture of the place, John Howard brought in laws that deny workers the right to silence, and they can be hauled in front of building commission and forced to name names about who was at a meeting or face six months imprisonment. And when they go home from that interrogation, they can't even tell the fa their families that they've been interrogated or they can get in prison for that as well. That was brought in by Howard and still exists. And for me, there is a thread that runs through David Hicks, our immigration laws, our terrorism laws, our workplace laws and Julian Assange. The examples abound of situations where a so-called exceptional situation means that the usual rights and protections shouldn't apply. But some of our political leaders have forgotten that it is exactly at the times when someone embarrasses a government or says something unpopular that they are in need of the strongest defence, and especially when they have broken no law. And I want to pause here to refer to an important point that Jennifer made about the allegations in Sweden. I think it's of course difficult at a distance to form a view about that case. And while some of the alleged activities might not amount to crimes under Australian law, I believe that the women in question have as much right to be heard as Julian Assange has to be presumed innocent. But I also wonder when every government will act with as much concern towards sexual assault allegations as the United Kingdom and Sweden might be to be But to return to the subject of tonight, in what I think can only be a good sign for democracy and openness, I think that these situations that WikiLeaks find themselves in, uh, where they're going to be privy to information that is about things that are being said and done in our name, are only going to become more prevalent. As the connections between us build in new, interesting and often uncontrollable ways, so too will the desire for greater control over our lives, a greater say in what is happening, greater demands on those of us who are elected to do things in your name. As elected representatives, we Greens will continue to stand up for these basic principles of equality and liberty, principles that others have been all too willing to cast off in recent times. And we will, for example, seek to amend the important legislation that was referred to, that was introduced by fellow crossbencher Andrew Wilkie, that gives protection to journalists who report whistleblowing. We will seek in the Senate to broaden it, to include bloggers, online communicators and other journalists such as Julian Assange. And I have a very simple request tonight for our Prime Minister. I call on the government to guarantee that it will do all things necessary to ensure that Julian Assange and his team can return to Melbourne safely as soon as possible. Depending on... Because depending on what happens next week, or the few days thereafter, he may be ready to get on a plane and come back within a matter of days. Mr Assange has asked for this promise, and you've heard him seek that promise tonight, and as his local MP, I am now asking the Prime Minister for it on his behalf. I don't know if he still has a spare room in the house at Grattan Street, but I reckon there's probably a fair few people here tonight who can give him a room in Melbourne if he needs one. And so, to conclude, I think that all of you here tonight and everyone who's watching us online are, I suggest, standing up for much more than just Julian Assange. You're joining in the defence of some pretty basic principles of individual liberty and of equality before the law. You're making it clear that the future is one of more openness and collaboration and that attempts to prohibit this kind of activity are harmful and doomed. And you are making it clear that you understand that while it is Julian Assange today, it could be someone else tomorrow. Together with my fellow Greens and with all of you, I hope to do what I can to keep the internet open, increase the flow of information and to stand up for those who are doing the same. Thank you.
Adam, after tonight's forum, I wanted to ask you a little bit more in regards to Julian Assange's request that the Australian government assist him in coming home. Yes. And I wanted to know from the Greens' perspective what you'd be pursuing to see that happen. Yeah, well, the first thing is that from the start, that's what the government should have been doing. When he was under threat, when you had people like the advisor to the Canadian Prime Minister, US presidential candidates, past and present, calling for him and his team to be hunted down, their first response should have been to get on the front foot and uh, call for him to be protected. And uh, they haven't done that. And um, that's allowed a certain culture to fester. So that's the first thing they should do. Secondly, given the situation that we're in now, um, the immediate thing to make clear to Julian Assange and to his team is that as Australian citizens, depending on what happens in the process in the UK, that they've got a right to come back here and that we should do everything we possibly can to make that happen. So I think it's not good enough to just simply say we're going to provide consular assistance and the like. They should now be taking active steps to tell him that he will be able to come back here safely and then do whatever is needed to make that happen. Now, um, so there's a number of very concrete things they could do simply from saying that to then actually ensuring his passage back that I think would make the world a difference and that's what they should be doing. And one more question in regards to the issues that were raised tonight in terms of what WikiLeaks has revealed yeah. uh, about potentially war crimes, criminal actions that have taken place. One of the things that Rob mentioned earlier on to us tonight was the fact that as far as he's aware, no one is investigating the United States uh, attempt to uh, obtain DNA and, and a whole heap of other information from the United Nations. Uh, what's your position on that? Look. Uh Exactly right. I mean, uh, the, it, this has exposed a whole range of alleged activities that need investigation, and the, they should be investigating those with the same ferocity that they're pursuing WikiLeaks. And uh, I mean, the, one of the specific ones that's um, of concern to me in the events afterwards is that the threats made against Julian Assange are themselves probably an offence under Australian law. And so we've asked, it's an offence under Australian law to threaten an Australian citizen overseas. Now, that should be investigated as well. And we'll continue to ask because uh, you shouldn't be able to make these kind of threats lightly without any, without any pushback and without any investigation as to whether it's illegal. Um, I can probably predict what response we'll get when we keep asking, but I think it's important to ask. I mean, and it's important to push it because what does it say that you're allowed to get up and say someone should be hunted down and killed and there be no repercussions. More broadly, take the Afghanistan war for example. We've, we brought on a debate in Parliament that hasn't been had for a war that's been going on for almost as long as World War One and Two combined. We we're the ones that brought that on as the Greens. Now during the course of that we heard a lot of wrote responses from members of the government and the opposition about how we need to be there to stay the course etc. And then we learned from WikiLeaks cables that in fact our former Prime Minister and our Foreign Minister he readily admits that this terrifies him and we have other cables saying we can't see what the end to this is, which is exactly what we've been saying and it's the opposite of what people are saying in public. Um, so aside from the specific investigations, I mean I just think more openness, people are starting to, I think people probably know that these things are said anyway and so now we're finding out about it. Yeah, that's right. Thanks very much.